Huang. You will hear a conversation between an organizer of a camping trip and a man asking for information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, this is Roberta. Who may I ask is calling? Hey there, Roberta. Joan Roberts gave me your number. I'm calling about the um, camping trip at the lake. Big Bear, is it? Oh, my name's Colin, by the way. Colin, yes. Joan said you'd be calling. You and your son are coming along, right? Yes, Peter and I are really interested, but I've got some questions for you, if you don't mind. Do you have a few minutes? Of course, Colin. For starters, what's the schedule like? It's a short trip, a little less than two full days. On day one, we'll all meet at the public library and set off at 6am. How long a drive is it to the campgrounds? It's one hour exactly. So, from 7am to 2 in the afternoon, we'll get everything set up. After that, we'll have lunch and review the schedule so that everyone knows what's going on. Once that's done, we'll head off to hike the grassland trails for about three hours. And, from about 5pm until lights out, we'll do a nice dinner for everyone, share stories, and teach everyone some campfire songs. Sounds perfect. What about the second day? Well, it's an early start that morning. Everyone should be ready to eat breakfast by 6. 7.30 to noon, we'll float on the Whitewater River. Lunch will be served at noon and we'll break down the camp starting at 1.30pm. After that's finished, we'll head back to town. Any equipment we should bring along? There'll be life vests for everyone, but the part of white water we'll be floating is quite calm this time of year. As I'm sure Joan mentioned, everyone will need to bring a full set of camping gear. I've got a list here somewhere. OK, each person should bring a tent, sleeping bag and pillow. For footwear, a pair of good, sturdy boots for hiking is best. Those can be worn for the rest of the trip too, but I'd bring along some old shoes for the floating trip. As far as clothes go, just the normal stuff will be fine. Jeans, some t-shirts, socks, that sort of thing. Um, remember also to bring some stuff in case of emergencies. Everyone will need a torch with extra batteries. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. A torch, huh? Unfortunately, ours just broke a couple of days ago. I'll run to the shop tomorrow to grab a new one. No problem. Happens to everybody sooner or later. While you're there, you should probably buy some drinking water. Six large bottles per person should be plenty. Will the camping area have running water? Can't we just use that? Yes, and it's a clean supply, but not always reliable. And you'll need to bring some along for the hike and float trip. Same goes for food. Although there'll be plenty to eat for everyone, I'd definitely recommend bringing along an emergency food supply. You won't regret it, I promise. I'd say one pack of whole grain snack bars. Also, please bring along a pack of matches and sharp folding knife. We'll go over basic knife safety and campfire making at some point during day one. I forgot to mention that earlier, sorry. It's fine. One of the main reasons Peter and I wanted to go on this trip was to learn some outdoor skills. Growing up in the city, I never learned any as a kid and think it's important to pass this kind of knowledge down to the next generation. I couldn't agree more. It's easy to lose touch with nature and so many people miss out on opportunities until they're simply too old to enjoy them anymore. No time like the present, eh? Joan mentioned something about the fees. There's a deposit due pretty soon and we should probably bring some cash with us, right? That's right. Since we're going as a group, we get a special rate. The campsite fees $20 and food's $50, which includes your meals and drinks. Remember, lunch and dinner are provided on the first day, and we're doing breakfast and lunch on day two. The fees for hiking and floating are $5 and $20 respectively, so it's $95 altogether. We'll collect the fees in advance, and the first $50 is due two weeks before the trip. The remaining $45 will be collected before we leave from the library parking lot. Some folks have asked about refunds. 
currently there are no refunds just because we have out-of-pocket expenses for the bus rental, gas and food. If that changes, we'll let everyone know. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech from a director of a charity. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi everyone, and thanks so much for being here today. I've got to say I'm encouraged by the number of people in our communities, both locally and in the province, who have shown up to provide help and support. First of all, I guess I should introduce myself. My name's Robin Liu, and I'm the director of the Shelter Society, which, of course, provides all sorts of vital assistance to the homeless population. Now, for some of you, this may very well be your first time to be here with us, and I believe it's necessary to understand a bit about the Society's background and why it does what it does. Since opening its doors in 1953, the Society's come a long way. It started in the basement of the Cedars Restaurant over in Sidonville, just 20 miles from here. From those most humble beginnings, though, things have really taken off. Headquartered in Camdenton, we now have offices in seven cities, including here in Carson City, and employ 50 full-time staff members. Nearly 500 volunteers pull together each and every year to help the society with its fundraising and homeless assistance activities. Now, our mission statement includes not only providing the homeless with the assistance they need when they need it, but also a commitment to bettering their lives. I know that when most people see homeless folks on the street, they look the other way or are just not sure if there's anything they can do. But I'm here to tell you that this is a condition, however temporary, that can affect any of us at any time. Just look at the numbers. There are over a thousand homeless here and more than 50,000 in the province representing a 50% increase in the last 10 years and 30% in the last five years alone. That by itself tells us there's a pattern to the issue, and that pattern is economics, plain and simple. Our area manufacturing facilities have closed, charity funding is at an all-time low, and cuts in government programs certainly haven't helped matters. More and more of our citizens and former neighbors desperately need our help. Even if you can't donate money because things are tight, donating your time is just as valuable. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Let's see, where was I? Uh, oh yes, this year's charity drive is the most ambitious one yet. We have three absolutely outstanding staff members who are each responsible for different areas of the drive and our programs in general. Marla Sunderland, who comes from Vixen, is tasked with operating our food pantry and clothing donation programs. The food pantry helps people help themselves by offering items that can be taken away to be prepared and eaten at any time. As we're always in need of more food for the pantry, Marla wanted me to say that if you wish to help out, 
Please donate any tinned items, such as soups and veggies and dry goods, like um, oatmeal, cereal, and powdered milk. Clothing donations have increased this year, and even though we do end up cleaning all donated items thoroughly, we ask that you please donate only store-bought items or gently used ones. Please no torn or ripped items or anything missing buttons or anything like that. It'd be great if the pieces came to us in decent condition. Next up, we have Leticia Perez from right here in Carson City. She operates our soup kitchen, which provides hot meals to the homeless five days a week. The kitchen takes a lot of time and effort, so aspiring chefs are welcome. Leticia also funds our new child care facility. Although it's just started, we're serving the children of several families already. We need talented volunteers, though, and anyone with previous education experience is welcome to come lend us a hand. Last, but certainly not least, is our most senior staffer, Dr. Roman Aronov. Dr. Aronov has been practicing medicine for over 30 years in over a dozen countries and runs our health clinic and job placement assistant programs. I'm sure by now you're familiar with his work. The Shelter Society's health clinic program is among the best in the nation, offering free primary and preventive care for our most impoverished citizens. Dr. Aronoff would like to remind everyone that our stores of medical items always run low, and any help in that area would be appreciated by both himself and the patients he helps. Every day... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a teaching assistant and two students about their public speaking class project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Oh, hey there, Galia, Arshad. I was just finishing up my marking for this week's assignment. Nice job, both of you, by the way. I think you both earned pretty good scores. Wow, really? I wasn't expecting that at all. I ran out of time and just wrote down whatever popped into my head first. So far, I'm looking to enjoy myself at uni, despite what my parents think. My parents constantly pressure me to pay attention to my grades and goals. Maybe that's why I'm so bossy. But we almost always get the same score, Arshad. Only difference is I spend hours on my work, and it all comes easily to you. It's kind of upsetting. Don't worry so much, Galia. You're super organised and confident, a born leader. Um, Mizukello? Is Dr Humphreys around by any chance? I know he's been out, but we thought we might catch him before the weekend. Is he still on holiday with Mrs. Humphreys? That was ages ago, Arshad. They went to Rome for a bit, but had to come back early because his sister broke her leg on a ski trip, so he had to visit her in the hospital. He came back for two days, but lately I've been in charge of his students and lectures because he left town again to resume his research. Don't worry, he'll be back next week. All right. Could you help us answer a few questions about our team project? Sure, I'll do my best. Public speaking isn't exactly my speciality. I wanted to go into mass communications as an undergraduate, but my teaching assistant at the time convinced me to major in business communications instead. After one semester, I realised I hated it and switched. It all worked out for the best, though, and I've focused on intercultural communications ever since. I hope you can help us, Mrs. Akalo. I think we're struggling with our project. 
I don't know if we're going to be ready in two weeks. I'm good at organising information, but speaking in public scares me. And it seems I'm the only one coming up with usable topics and ideas here. I know Arshad has good intentions and wants to help, but we're not working together very well. It's partly mine and Dr Humphrey's fault. We only give very general guidance about the project. Usually the teams work everything out by themselves, but... Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Is there anything we can do? I just know there ought to be some way to use our talents to our advantage. I honestly believe that we can come up with a good presentation if we try hard enough. Talents? You can't be serious. Do you have some deeply hidden talents I don't know about or something? Look, Galia, I think you're a nice person. I know I'm not the most motivated student in the world, and I'm certainly not overworked. But if this project's going to succeed, you'll have to treat me as an equal, OK? Well said, Arshad. Galia, I know you're under pressure, and with a little practice, you'll do well in your part of the project, which will look great in your CV. But remember, you have a teammate, and there's no way your project's going to be a good one, especially with the deadline so close, unless you two find a way to work together. Make sense? Yes, I suppose you're right. I'm sorry, guys. Arshad, I think we have some ideas that can work. If you trust me to choose the best one, I really think that can help. And I didn't mean to imply that you're untalented. I know you're great with all things technical. Could you use your laptop to create some nice visual aids or something? That's an awesome idea. Tell me what needs to happen and I'll make sure it looks great. Deal? Deal. See, I knew you two would be all right. You just have to work together, that's all. Arshad... Any idea what you want to do after you graduate? I think you have a bright future in technology. I know you said your folks were in finance. Any interest there? I'd really like to have my own business. Just not sure what kind yet. Galia? Actually, I wanted to be an entrepreneur for the longest time too. Funny. I didn't know we had that in common, Arshad. Now that you both have found some common ground, it will be Galia's job today to settle on a topic. Once that's done, Galia, let me know. Normally, you could come back here to the office, but I'll be over in the IT department trying to get my email fixed. Best option is to call me, all right? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part four. Part four. You will hear a speech from a scientist. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to address such a well-respected group of colleagues and civic leaders, and, though I wish I were here purely in the interests of science, I am afraid that what I have to say has very serious implications for us all. For in our present age, we often hear the name of great explorers used to describe the current stage of space exploration. Space agencies and other promoters of space travel regularly use these mythologies to create a sense of excitement and high adventure about the challenge of space. But behind the excitement of adventure, just as in the time of the explorers, lies the hidden layer of exploitation. Like the rulers in the past who paid for these excursions in hopes of greater economic rewards, 
There are forces in our world today lining up to harvest the benefits from the exploitation of the outer reaches. In his book, Mining the Sky, Untold Riches from the Space Rocks, Comets, and Planets, scientist John S. Lewis paints a picture of enormous profits to be made by nations that control the territory on the moon, Mars, or other planetary bodies. For it is these planetary bodies, he maintains, that contain the untapped resources and riches of the future. Lewis says, and I quote, The global expansion of technology and civilization brought about by the age of Earth exploration is but a glimpse of the opportunities before us as humans move out into space. Let's take a step back and think about that for just one moment. Despite all the mundane news we hear about on a daily basis, we are, in a very real way, right now, even as we speak, engaged in a struggle for control over the future of the Earth and space itself. If we haven't been deeply concerned up to now, we should be. We really should. A January 1995 New York Times article by science writer Lawrence Joseph entitled Who Will Mine the Moon? introduces us to the rare gas called helium-3 and asks the telling question, will the moon become the fuel-rich region of the 21st century? Mr. Joseph concludes, if we ignore the potential of this remarkable fuel, we could slip behind in the race for control of the global economy and our destiny beyond. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 36 to 40. Numerous voices at space agencies and from private industry are now calling for immediate action. David Gump, president of Lunacorp, recently made the case in a space news piece when he said, Commercial activities should be the building blocks of the first moon base rather than afterthoughts. Discovery of the fabulously valuable buried ice fields at the moon's poles has dramatically increased the value of a moon base and the logic of a primary role for free enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that, indeed, much of the groundwork for space exploitation is now being laid. The surface of the moon has already been mapped by previous missions, and moon rovers are soon expected to drill for samples of moon ice at the moon's north pole. Of course, if there's wealth to be discovered, humans can and probably should seek it out. But without proper legal controls and agreements between interested parties, we're just asking for trouble. Another source of trouble on the horizon is the use of nuclear power for space exploration. Nuclear power has become the power source of choice for space agencies. Not only has the use of nuclear power for onboard generators for deep space missions been promoted, but there is growing evidence that the space exploration and exploitation adventure will soon be flooded with nuclear materials. Now, assuming that we wish to continue space missions with humans in control, how exactly are we going to ensure that the brave explorers of our time do not return home with health issues that are difficult and costly to resolve? One final concern is space junk. Yes, you heard me right, space junk. The more we explore and exploit space, the more junk we create. It's as if we're taking our problems on Earth, like pollution, and just expanding them to the infinite horizon. Studies have indicated that within the next 10 years, space junk will be such a serious problem that any future of space tourism will be very much in doubt. So, as space resources will become more and more concentrated in the hands of large companies, regular folks who just want to have a look at the moon or Mars may simply be unable to do so. Exploitation will have shut out exploration altogether. What a shame that would be. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers. Thank you.